Hello and welcome back to The Real Music Talks. Today's guest is Josh Johnson, founder of Dancing With Friends, a London-based night with a focus on charity, inclusivity and fun. How are you doing, Joss? Hi, mate. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad at all. So, you know, thanks for being here today. Let's get right into it. Um, so for people that don't know you, how would you describe yourself and your involvement in music? Oh, what a question. Um, I guess involvement in music is what I'll start with and then I'll go and describe myself afterwards. But um, so my involvement in music, so I set up a dance with friends along with, uh, along with a friend of mine. Um, and uh, the night, as you've kind of touched on, really, was, was kind of focused around um, inclusivity, fun. We don't take ourselves too seriously. We know that a lot of people in the um, in the music industry can be quite sort of difficult or kind of like try and live up to certain uh, certain personas and stuff like that. And we wanted to kind of break that down. So that's kind of where it started from. So from that, I guess, um, my my kind of general ethos is give everything a chance um, give everyone a chance and, and try and kind of get as, as involved as you can. Um, so yeah, I DJ as a collective of us now of, of six, uh, six DJs as part of Dance with Friends. Um, and then we kind of bring in other headliners and stuff like that kind of, uh, along the journey. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's kind of been my, my main involvement in music so far over the last couple of years. Great. Um, so where did the idea first come from to actually start this night? You know, like what actually sparked that in the first place? So... Myself and Aaron, um, who I've met through various house parties and stuff, we've, we've both DJed for years. He used to um, run a night back in uh, Cardiff when he was at uni there um, called Be Happy, which obviously similar ethos and kind of how it's set up around um, kind of bit of fun uh, type thing. Um, me and him were chatting at a house party, uh, arguably too late at night, um, and just kind of going through like the, well, I'm moving to London he's predominantly now based in London. He lives outside, but moving to London soon. Um, you know, why don't we try and kind of approach something? Didn't really know how to start, where to go, um, especially in London at this point. Um, and so kind of just started just pinging those mails around to kind of clubs, pub clubs, all that kind of stuff, basically the start out kind of spaces. Um, so yeah, kind of all formed over, over a beer. Um, and then a, uh, a pub club called Market House, Gave us the gave us the opportunity to kind of set up our own night, which is not something we initially we thought we were just going like to aim aim to get booked somewhere and kind of play as it was, rather than kind of create a whole night. Um, but I'm kind of pleased it took us in the direction it did because it meant it gave us the license to kind of choose what our night was about, rather than trying to kind of like shoehorn us into um, into someone else's night. Makes sense. How did you sort of decide that from there? Then I guess you know, like that's obviously a better way to do it. I'd say. Um, but how did you think, like, first plan that night, you know, what did you want the night to be about? Um, I guess when, when we were kind of sitting down and thinking about it, once we got over the initial shot that we actually had to put together a night at this point, um, we were kind of thinking, uh, what, what do we want to be known for? We'd obviously focused around the fact that predominantly at that point, we'd kind of come up with a name um, that was very much Aaron, Aaron's doing with the name. Uh, he'd kind of had it in the back of his mind that Dance With Friends is something that he wanted to, to kind of create as a concept. Um, and had thought that in, in Cardiff and kind of wanted to bring it to life. So we kind of had got, got the name there. Um, and thankfully, on, on, on the back of that, we had enough friends that we could rope into it to actually turn up to the night, which is obviously a good way to start. Um, so the kind of thought process at that point was, right, what type of genres, what type of music? Generally, we tend to play um, and always have kind of played anything in that kind of disco house, more underground house rather than the kind of chart stuff. A um, lot of garage um quite a lot of afrobeat stuff coming into it as well so it's kind of that kind of blend of genres we didn't want any anyone to come to one of our nights and think it was just a kind of generic run-of-the-mill type night we kind of wanted something that would be a little bit different um and that people might kind of either go in there and then hear songs they haven't heard in ages or heard in a while or or kind of um wanted to go in and then feel like you could kind of dance with anyone in that space and they are arguably by the end of the night they probably would become your friend if they weren't your friend to start with type thing so that was kind of the whole uh ethos behind the night makes sense and i guess like behind that um maybe do you want to talk about your background in music so how did you first get into music have you ever learned any instruments um i guess where's the interest and the passion come from sure um yeah in school i played guitar i would never say i was that good at it to be honest with you i mean it was the classic kind of you pick an instrument when you're growing up uh my sister went down the route of piano i went down the route of guitar um i enjoyed it and i got kind of like relatively sort of okay it never did grades or anything like that but enough to kind of possibly get me through um my 
uh, music uh, kind of pre GCSE type uh, type level. Um, at which point then I was kind of like, oh, I'm not too sure how I fit into this music world. Like, is it guitar that's kind of not the right thing for me? And so I'd kind of at that point stopped doing anything to do with music um, until I. I think I was about 18, 19, probably around the time that I'd actually started going out and, and kind of seeing the music that I was listening to rather than kind of just going out to sort of standard bars and that sort of stuff. Um, and that was very much kind of when I was growing up around, in and around Bristol, probably where we kind of first met back, back in the days of motion and stuff like that. Um, and kind of hearing that sort of music and then thought, well, I guess off the back of this, why don't I kind of give DJ a go? Like, is that something that could be of interest? Um, and as the classic age that I was, couldn't afford anything, so it had to rely on a Christmas present of a set of DJ decks, new Mark Mixtrap Pro 3s, great place to start. Um, and kind of just messing about in bedrooms, house parties, all that kind of stuff um, is kind of what then inspired me to think, like, actually, this is both good fun, allows me to play with genres that I would never have been able to play before if I was playing on a kind of um, uh, a more classical instrument or, or guitar. Um, and I think for me, that engagement with loads of different genres, mixing things together that probably shouldn't go together on paper and kind of messing around with things is kind of what then inspired me to want to do it more. Um, so, yeah, I think it just gave me, a, in, for my position, it gave me more of a diverse knowledge of music and different genres that I just didn't necessarily know before. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how I go into it. How did you sort of build up the techniques and the skills? Because um, obviously, you know, you don't just get a decks and then know exactly what you're doing, right? Like, how did you learn all the different things that you need to do as a DJ? Oh, man, my poor parents. They must have heard some absolute clangers. Um, I mean, the fact that I was having to live through the pain of what was going through my headphones at the time, and they certainly were. Um, there were a lot of YouTube tutorials at the time, so I never actually did any kind of lessons for it or, any, or anything at all. But yeah, a lot, lot of DJ, um, DJ YouTube tutorials. Then as I kind of, moved to London and more and more people that I met also then DJ'd, it was kind of picking up a lot of stuff from them. Um, so as I met Aaron, uh, he had been DJing for probably six or seven years by the time I'd met him and I'd only been DJing for sort of two. Um, and just kind of learning from one another, spending time down at Pirate Studios and kind of like learning with bigger and better kit. Um, I kind of moved on to, I've, I've got CDJs now and obviously had to move up to something that's more club-like in, in terms of what I was playing on so that it makes that transition to playing in clubs that bit that easier. Um, but that comes with a whole wealth of new things to learn as you're kind of going through the spaceship that is the mixer in front of you and kind of like what you do with all the different knobs and, and faders and, and buttons. So um, yeah, a lot of trial and error, man. Like there's you know, any DJ that would sit in front of you, any kind of professional DJ and say that they've never made a mistake in their life and their whole way of learning. It's just like, it's just completely not true. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a lot of clangers, a lot of things that shouldn't have happened that, that did happen even during live sets that you just kind of have to brush it off as a, a learning experience. And you don't, you don't forget it because you don't want to do it again. I guess I, I think, think the key difference if you compare it to sort of like um, someone playing an instrument, right, is every set can be completely different and, you might have a plan of like what you want to play a little bit, but ultimately you might also pull out a track that you might just be feeling on the night. Right. So I guess it's a bit like if you're writing a guitar solo, you might throw in extra notes and stuff like that, but sure. the whole DJ set is completely kind of off the cuff in some ways. Yeah. I think a lot of it is I kind of plan a base of what my rough set is probably going to be on. There's going to be a couple of key songs that I'm like, right, definitely want to get that in there. Um, but then a couple of them might be based on what the crowd's looking like. Like if, if you're starting to empty the room, you probably need to change what you're playing. Um, so you need to like think about how you can kind of keep the, keep the energy in the room and, and sort of what songs might do that. Um, and a part of the whole night and those kind of songs that take people back to certain memories and stuff um, is kind of that like digging in the archives of like, what were the songs that we were hearing that were underground back in 2010, 2011 when we were all in school and stuff and kind of like what, how can we bring those into our sets um, and kind of bring stuff back back into live music and back into uh, the kind of club nights that people have forgotten um, that are kind of like lost otherwise. So, uh, so yeah, it's definitely, you plan a rough, a rough course of what you think you're going to do. Um, and then past that point, I mean, the whole like every plan fails first contact with the enemy type thing is very much true. Like if you planned out your set start to finish, you almost certainly will not play that set start to finish. <laughs> yeah for sure that makes complete sense um maybe if you want to talk about the nights you've done so far then you know like 
how what have been like maybe their successes and failures and how has it sort of grown over time sure man um so we set up in uh 2019 so june 2019 was when we opened uh with market house um so we did a couple of kind of opening nights there um that's a kind of it, back before it's been it's been changed and taken over and and um is thankfully reopened now again after covid which is great to see um but you used to have a pub downstairs club upstairs um which for a pub club it had a full function one sound system it was like a nut, nuts setup that they had for a kind of pub club um but really supportive venue for us they gave us an amazing deal to open with that made it like a really secure deposit style environment that we could earn that deposit back if the bar took enough money and that sort of thing and thankfully for us that night um we have a lot of very willing friends but that night uh, sold out and kind of allowed us to recoup all of the money that we put into it plus more and kind of gave us a really good base to think actually like we can kind of make more on this so we did a couple of events with them um we did a mind charity fundraiser i think that was like our third event um and raised a thousand pounds of mind charity so one of the kind of other parts to our business is all of us that run it, it's not our main profession. We all have our own our kind of main professions on the side. So the benefit that it gives us is that we don't ultimately have to pay ourselves from the money that we generate. So we tend to throw a lot of charity events or um, reinvest the money in kind of growing and doing bigger things. So we'd kind of done that charity event for uh, Mind. And then off the back of doing that, we'd caught the attention of the club that's kind of across the road called Prince of Wales um, or the club's called PAL. Um, so they're big in the kind of disco scene. So they've got a lot of uh, people that play there, like Norman Jay's played, Fat Tony, uh, Crazy P, Horsemeat Disco, some of those kind of like big kind of classic um, club lineup names. And, and Matt got in touch with us, um, asking us basically if we wanted to go over there and, and kind of play the side room for him. Um, so we were like, yeah, absolutely. So the start of 2021, uh, it was February the 29th was our gig, which was supporting Moose Tea um which like legendary in the kind of like disco um uh disco scene so obviously gas to play that what we didn't know was a month after that we were all going to go into a lockdown and everything was going to grind to a halt so yeah 2020 uh 2020 wasn't exactly the the perfect year to uh to kick off with with nights but um one thing that we were kind of i guess we, we were incredibly lucky throughout covid that as and when the opportunity came up that that clubs could reopen, albeit in a socially distanced way. Um, Power has both a rooftop and also a very large indoor, what is obviously their dance floor. So they'd split it so that outdoors you could do um, socially distanced bar service to table service, sorry, with food. They had a full kitchen. They kind of had everything set up um, that meant that we were able to continue to do kind of full takeovers of the whole roof space. Um, and kind of sell it out quite consistently for them to help them kind of stay open. So we, we kind of built a really good relationship with them that, you know, we don't need to charge a huge amount of money because that's not the purpose of why we do what we do. We do it because we love the music and we want to give something back. Um, and so they're kind of that relationship that we built with them by when we first kind of started in the lockdown months, we'd said we will play for free. Like we actually just want to support the venue, support you guys kind of get through this. You know, the, the whole nightlife industry was massively pushed to one side. Well, the whole music industry, not just the nightlife industry, was massively pushed to one side, was completely discounted. Um, and, you know, you're seeing places in like Germany getting nightlife support packages and all these kind of things going on in Europe that and globally that we just weren't seeing. Um, so, yeah, we kind of offered to them that we pay for free. They politely declined and said, no, we will still pay you. We want to obviously like support you guys too. <laughs> We're just like, man, we can't even give ourselves away at this point um so uh yeah we've been then carried on playing playing with them doing uh socially distant stuff then things started to reopen um and we've carried on kind of supporting so the names i called out earlier like friend within norman j pat tony uh crazy p are all people that we've now supported on kind of um we've played side rooms they've played uh main rooms all kind of done handovers um and recently we took over uh prince of wales to do the dance with friends takeover um, so Matt's done it with a few other nights that he's kind of supported and grown in London and, and said he was like, it'd be a good time for us to do it with you guys. Um, and so along with him, we then booked uh, PBR Street Gang to be our headliner, um, which is great fun. So the, the club capacity is somewhere on the region of like, I guess like 650, 700 if you were to absolutely ram it. Um, and we kind of three quarters sold it out, which we were really pleased with, but a great kind of opening take overnight. Um, and that was where we'd kind of then transitioned into like the main room and, and playing on bigger kit and all that kind of stuff. So 
Um, thankfully, Matt also thought it was a success and the venue thought it was a success that they've booked us to do two more takeovers in the future, um, which is great. So that's going to be like September and, uh, and November. Um, but then we've done, we did a big boat party down the Thames, which was uh, for Centrepoint Charity. Um, so that was 250 cap boat. Uh, sold that out and raised two and a half grand for Centerpoint, which was uh, supports young homelessness. Um, so we kind of thought about the charities that probably needed support during and, and throughout the pandemic. And obviously homelessness was becoming a more and more prevalent thing. Um, so yeah, things kind of built and grew and, and kind of have taken us to, that's pretty much to where we are now. Um, and got kind of a few things on the horizon, which are cool. Um, but things that, I guess like things that have, that we would change about what we do. If I'm honest with you, we've, we've been blessed with that kind of relationship that we've had with, with power that they don't give us much that we look back on and think like, man, we should, we should have changed anything to our venue strategy. If we had a venue strategy, which we didn't at the time, it was just play. Um, so I think the only things that we definitely should have done earlier, uh, is retargeting on marketing. Um, so that kind of once you play an event, get your footage, get it up, target the audiences and sort of say, here's what went down at that night, follow us for more nights in the future. And we've only just started doing that now. And we're seeing like 50, 20 percent rises in, in Instagram followers every time we do that now. Um, so when we're, we're, I mean, that makes it sound like we're on huge followers. We're not at all. We're at like 475, I think it was something as of this morning um and that's because we've done one off the back of supporting crazy p last weekend so we're just trying to grow that following so i think yeah the advice on that would be the earlier you start retargeting and kind of connecting with the audience that might well have been in the club at the time or, or in the venue if you're doing a live performance um that's definitely that's huge um and then i think the other things that we're kind of focusing on now but but we're kind of um probably could have focused on slightly earlier is what other avenues are there like now we're talking to radio stations so we're talking to um brixton radio about a potential takeover um for a day and um i went on uh one of the djs called devay his show on why now world um, which is like an online kind of radio platform um again just like furthering the name and kind of and kind of pushing out of there so definitely could have done those two things a bit earlier than um than we probably did but hindsight's a wonderful thing right 2020 vision in hindsight yeah, you never know these things until you get there a lot of the time. Sure. Um, the main thing is like taking a lesson from it and learning for next time. Like that's that's the most important part. Um, so yeah, you know, it sounds like the brand's growing and everything. Like what is kind of the future plan? Like where would your kind of what would your ideal vision be, I guess, for like ten years' time if you're continuing to do it? So we've got kind of uh, I guess our like our short term goals are more things on radio, try and get more venues in. Um definitely, I mean like we only really play in South London at the minute. We've we did play in um Oslo and Hackney and are doing a Hackney social day party in June, eighteenth of June. Um so starting to kind of build those bridges around other parts of London, that's kind of step one. Radio stations is is a big one for us of kind of just like try and grow the name, grow the brand and, and kind of do that um, locally, both Brixton, but then also um, we want to get onto other radio stations like Threads Radio, NTS, all those kind of more undergroundy ones. Um, so that would be kind of step two. Then, I mean, the longer term goals is that like we'd absolutely love to do a day festival or I mean, longer than that, a weekend festival would be awesome. Um, I've, I've kind of know of people who've kind of done them in the past and obviously there's a lot of moving parts that go into that kind of piece of work like insurances land like etc so there's that's it well, that's a long way away from where, where we are now um but i think once we kind of in 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 between the two there's that kind of not just london but how do we then tap into like playing in manchester or playing in bristol and kind of starting to kind of go wider than just just where we are now um but I think the, the main thing for us really is we're, we're not trying to kind of like explode it as wide as possible early because we, we want to keep it in the same kind of spirit and mentality that we created it. Like we don't want it, to, we don't want it to get so big that we're having to split the groups in half and kind of we're all playing individual nights and it's not sounding like dancing with friends. Like we want it to, to kind of stick to the core of what we do. Um, ultimately, we, as I said before, it's not our main profession. so there may well come a tipping point for some of us like for myself and Aaron that, that currently run it it may well be that it gets to a stage where actually it is viable for us to do career-wise which would be awesome I would more than happily do that 
um, at the minute, the risk would be too high to kind of go into it um, in a whole, just knowing how much we'd need to earn to kind of pay back on it and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be like slow, considered growth. Um, but we've got kind of targets of like where we want to get to in terms of following and in terms of like where we want to get over the next sort of year or couple of years. Um, but I think if we could try and find a way of doubling our kind of like Instagram following by end of this year or even a year's time from now, um, a bit longer than a year, that would be kind of a really good result for us. Um, but I mean, in all honesty, we're just thankful that, any, that people turn up, <laughs> like the people come to the gigs, like that's the main thing. Um, we happily play to an empty room of people if we're all there just listening to it anyway. So, um, yeah. Great. No, it sounds like it's definitely growing for sure. And I think there's some lessons in what you said there, you know, like not relying on it just on your sole source of income means you can focus on creating a better night and you don't have to yeah. worry about making sure you can all be paid at the end of it. You yeah. can focus on actually the experience of what people are seeing and what they're coming to the event to. Absolutely. So I think, you know, that's quite a key lesson for musicians as well. Like, you know, if you're a band or something and you quit all your jobs and it's the only way you're going to make money, you're going to approach it with a different agenda which could potentially stop you from being as creative or doing things in the best way. Yeah, I completely agree. I think when you take, in most things, if you can take money out of the equation, you will ultimately give a better, a better end result, whatever that may be. I think that, that status that we're in where we can do that is a massive privilege. Like, you know, that's, we know that not every musician is in that place. Not every musician was able to play throughout COVID, all those kind of things Like we've had some, proper privileges um but yeah i think being able to focus on why we do what we do means that we can kind of bring it in exactly the way that we've planned to every single time um because yeah we could get to the end of the night and technically make a loss and actually it would still be not that bad of a result like we're not having to pay ourselves out of it um so yeah I guess um, taking money out of the equation in that sense then, you know, like what are the biggest challenges that you faced since you started doing it? Um, I think we had a, we had a big challenge around, we've, we've done, we've booked another boat party for this year. Um, and one of the things with that was we wanted to go bigger and better than we did last year. And we kind of wanted to take it to a different, I mean, to a different level to be cheesy about it, but like we wanted a bigger boat. We wanted to do two layers, two levels of sound all that kind of stuff um and i mean like looking at the financial investment that was needed to do that was more than we had generated in the last three years basically so th there is a level of risk that you that we would have had to have kind of done in order to push it to that next level and i think once we kind of discussed it and and worked through it we actually thought that's not worth doing for this year um there would the risk would have been too high and i think actually like financially there's there's a difference between like we can make a loss on that and we can kind of suck it up and absorb it and then there's like that that could actually be a serious amount of money that we might lose um so i think that that's a definite challenge is kind of you need to be bold but not too bold which is a really hard line to kind of get right um like there's definitely places where we've been too cautious but like there's just there's no denying that at all like um i kind of hold my hands up to that aaron is definitely more like kind of creative and, and creative focused about like how how we could kind of grow and, and kind of do these things and then i'm probably the guy that looks at it and then stares too long at the numbers and thinks like oh shit that's terrifying um so yeah i think that there's definitely a piece in like finding that good medium ground between like what's the risk and what are you willing to absorb risk wise and then like actually okay well we need to do something because if we keep doing the same then that's not really reinventing our night and kind of pushing it further either so um yeah, that's definitely a challenge kind of with with the um, with the financial side of things. The other side of it as well is um, we had a big debate internally around uh, at the time when we started, we obviously reinvested all of our money. Um, so none of the DJs were getting paid, i.e. that uh, us as, as um, shareholders were certainly not getting paid. But even at that point, we were like, well, let's just take every bit of money we get and, and keep growing the, growing the brand. Um, and actually, like we had another talk internally of, is that right? like we've got djs that are contributing to our night that we're all friends but like we've got djs that are contributing to our nights and we're not technically rewarding them in a way for doing so um and actually even though we were growing the brand like we still felt that we needed to give something back to them as well as just to kind of the business um so albeit small we now pay everybody gets paid at the end of every night it's it's just a small kind of token gesture type thing we don't need to do that and there are thresholds of like 
we if we don't turn over a certain amount for the event it's probably not right for us to pay out on it um but we kind of now give people money towards it might be that they've had to pay for like a pirate studio session for that night it might be they've had to pay for taxis or whatever to get to the venue to kind of cover it off um so we just make sure that whilst the general premise is that we do retain all of the money in the business um as of the last kind of couple of months we made that switch to be like we actually need to kind of give something back to um to our guys to make sure that they're not out of pocket just supporting us um as a as a brand and as a business yeah that makes sense if it's like a personal cost to you and obviously yeah. you're having to cover that anyway so then essentially personally you'd be out of pocket so that makes perfect sense um so if someone was listening to this and they were thinking of starting their own night um or a bit to be fair a music business what advice would you give them um do do research is the, is the main thing i think we we kind of just went for like a scattergun approach when we first opened it was just like talk to anyone and everyone to try and work out how we can set a night up. And I think a bit of research, a bit of planning, we stumbled and kind of fell on our feet, but I think do your research of what you want your night to be. That's kind of the, or your event to be, or your kind of, um, uh, your kind of performance to be is kind of the main thing. Like think about what your niche might be. Um, and, and look at like, say for us, we started off in Brixton, but in Brixton, there is, um, an amazing Afrobeat scene. There's a relatively like there's an established kind of underground house scene but actually there probably wasn't much in that kind of like a middle ground kind of bringing it together um uh type space so that's kind of where we then popped up and we're bringing in like bits of afro beats into it bits of garage into it and bits of kind of house and disco and kind of created it around that kind of um style so yeah i think finding a niche is kind of the main thing um uh just try and tap into your to your mates and your followers as much as possible to try and kind of use them to support you whether that's just a lot of people do it out of the goodness of their own heart in general but like we were super reliant on our friends to a buy tickets um but also to um tell their friends about it to push it and to kind of help us grow um so kind of rely on that um and then i think you know if 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 you have the ability to not start off with it being you your sole purpose and your sole form of income i think that that's a probably a good place to start is try and just like balance that risk um even if it's that you know it's going to you want it to be the main source of your income but then you're still doing some kind of side work and like just keep that income coming in and don't put yourself at a bigger at too big of a risk in order to set it up um and then beyond that being honest there is quite a lot of luck like you need to have good luck and, and kind of things be on your side and, and people kind of liking it. But most of it, if you put in enough kind of time and effort into how you think the night is could go, um, and with a sprinkling of luck, generally speaking, it'll probably come off well. Um, but yeah, the main thing is just don't over leverage yourself. Don't put yourself in a risky position to set up that night. Um, take like, be bold and kind of, and m just model and manage what your risk is going to be. Yeah, I'd put it, I guess, like, you don't want to set yourself up to fail. Like, otherwise, oh. there's no point. Like, you'd, it's just going to be, like, you're just going to get, like, um, discouraged from doing it again yeah. if the, if you're just setting yourself up to fail every time. So it's better to plan that and understand what that risk could be. Yeah. Um, but anyway, Josh, it's been great chatting. We're nearly out of time now. Um, but is there anything else you'd like to leave the audience with as we close out today? Um, not particularly other than uh, if ever you see the name Dancing with Friends, so we're, we are at Dancing with Friends LDN for London um, on Instagram. But yeah, if you've kind of listened to this and think you want to come on to a night, just drop us a DM, um, speak to us. We're going to give you any information you need, even if you just want to talk to someone about how to set up a night in kind of our field and, and what, how we've done it. Just drop us a DM. We're always happy to chat. Um, but no, thanks for having us on, man. It's been an absolute pleasure. No worries, man. It's been great. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you next time. Take care.